I am Zala Lenarcic from Joža Stefan uh, Institute in Slovenia, and I uh, well, welcome you, uh, everyone, on behalf of uh, the other organizers, uh, to the School on Out of Equilibrium Phenomena. Uh, so, well, yeah, I hope you'll enjoy it, uh, learn a lot, uh, meet new uh, colleagues, and have fun. So, uh, I mean, this program is uh, online, as you've uh, for sure noticed. So let me just remind you that today we start with the first poster session. Uh, it will be held like here inside, essentially in these corridors around uh, this lecture room. So you can hang your posters uh, anytime. In principle, it's today, it's from names from A to L. And after that, at uh, six, we'll have uh, get together cafeteria, so at the Adriatico guest house, which is down uh, at the like seaside, essentially. I mean, if like there's another hotel that's more down, so so if you don't know where it is, ask colleagues or or, or information or me. So essentially, you need to walk down. So so we'll just yeah have some finger food drinks down there. And uh, let me just yeah, uh, introduce our first speaker, Anatoly Polkonikov, um, from Boston University, that will uh, probably give some more introductory uh, lecture uh, on chaos and ergodicity in uh, quantum and classical systems. And uh, yeah, I guess you're encouraged to ask many questions yes, during yes, the lecture, definitely. so yeah, yeah. Uh, don't fun. hesitate, let's be interactive. Uh, so, as we learn more, yeah, please. All right, uh, it's, it's an honor to be the first speaker. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so, when I asked Alessandro Silver uh, what I should talk about, he said that I, I'm supposed to talk about chaos close to equilibrium. I was not exactly sure what it means, so I, I thought I will use it as sort of excuse um, uh, to talk about uh, uh, chaos and ergodicity and uh, sort of our recent works uh, understanding them uh, using adiabatic transformations and I'll come to that in, in later lectures. Uh, but I first will start from uh, some basic overview. I know some of uh, you probably new to these topics and I will try to give some overview of developments uh, in the last you know, 30 years. So before I start, I do encourage you to really ask questions, just interrupt. If I don't see your hand, just say question loudly. Uh, if I don't do it, I think many of you will be lost very quickly. Uh, I, I hope that it doesn't happen. And questions help not just you, they help other students to catch up. Because if I speak, I, I might not notice that I'm say, too fast and so on. So in other, uh, disclaimer I want to make is that, of course, chaos itself has very, very long history, and I'm not an expert in any of the topics, and there are actually experts in the audience who know uh, answers to some of your potential questions much better than I do. So, but I'll try to do my best. So I will um, try to start from some really basic concepts of chaos, and I will only talk about like chaos in physics and Hamiltonian systems. There is, of course, like huge chaos theory in other dynamical systems. I'm not even going to mention those. And I also will not mention some of the other topics uh, which other speakers will discuss, like circuits and so on. I'm not an expert there, but also there will be other talks about this. So I will talk a little bit about chaos, ergodicity, and determinism, and then uh, I will spend more time on, on I guess, quantum ergodicity, uh, against state simulation hypothesis. I will try to distinguish chaos and ergodicity uh, in, in small classical systems. We know about this distinction for a long time, but it's actually, uh, this distinction is always there. Uh, and then, uh, in the last lectures, I think I will mostly talk about our own work uh, in the last, I don't know, five plus years about how we can sort of merge uh, concepts of quantum and classical chaos in a single framework. Uh, so we'll see how it works.
So, uh, yeah, even if you look into uh, I know, popular literature, definition of chaos is, is uh, still not unique. There is a more precise definition of, mathematical definition of chaos, but when you talk about chaos in general, um, then usually uh, uh, we talk about chaos as uh, 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 lack of determinism. So, and of course, there is a very long history uh, um, uh, as I said, like of what is, chaos, what is chaos, where it comes from. So uh, we know, like, uh, for now I will try to use uh, chaos and ergodicity interchangeably, uh, but later I will sort of try to separate these two notions. So we know that statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is uh, uh, founded on, on ideas of chaos. In a way, you can say that chaos gives us a measure for probability, right? When we talk about Gibbs weight or microcanonical weight and so on. Uh, so, and uh, uh, there are many laws in, in statistical mechanics, but one of this, I guess, uh, main laws is the second law of thermodynamics, which basically tell us that any sufficiently complex system, an isolated system, if left uh, alone, means that it's Hamiltonian, is time independent, uh, it reaches an equilibrium state. And this state is basically maximally random, so maximizing entropy, uh, within the constraints that say we have fixed volume, fixed energy, fixed number of particles, and so on. So, and then this is example I, I, I stole from the internet of uh, a chaotic motion in, in uh, a closed but very complex system. So it's a glass of water where we uh, put an ink of drop. And then what happens is that uh, as time evolves, uh, the motion of the blue molecules uh, expands through the glass and the system becomes more and more chaotic, right? Because uh, 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 our probabilities to find uh, blue molecules in the glass become more and more delocalized. So we can less and less predict where blue molecules are. But if you really stare in this picture, you will see, no, no, this is not the most chaotic state. It's a very simple state, right? Because we can describe it with uniform concentration of bluing. So most chaotic state is somewhere here. So, and this is sort of, uh, I, in my opinion at least, this simple picture kind of underlies why uh, uh, chaos and ergodicity in some sense lead to simplicity. And I will try to, to uh, uh, talk a bit more about uh, this. So maximally random state is actually simple. It's more predictable. So the second law has, of course, many implications, and uh, uh, many of you uh, know them. Let me just show a couple of examples. So when a ship sails from, I don't know, say, I don't know, Boston to, to Trieste or Venice, uh, it has to use fuel. And, and why? There is so much energy in the ocean, right? It's warm. Uh, there are lots of molecules. They move fast and so on. Why don't we take this energy for free? And the reason is precisely that the motion is chaotic. So if we take energy from molecules of, of, of the ocean and put it into motion of the ship, we actually reduce entropy of the system, right? Because motion of molecules is more random than motion of the ship. So this is the reason we have to uh, uh, use the fuel. And another, of course, very famous example is that heat always flows from hot to cold. Uh, gain an isolated system without adding extra work. And uh, this is also, uh, as you all know, leads, uh, this also leads to entropy increase. So now let's go to like, physics and start from maybe the simplest example I can imagine, uh, just particle in one dimension. This is predictable, stable, that's all what we cover in, in, in uh, beginning, uh, even high school uh, lectures. Maybe a bit, I'll talk about Hamiltonian, so maybe not high school, but some first year of undergraduate mechanics. So in one dimension, we know motion is stable. We solve various systems, square well, harmonic oscillators, like a nonlinear oscillator. 
And uh, we all know that the key reason for stability is the fact that you have energy conservation. So uh, if you have some potential V of X and energy, which is P squared over 10 plus V of X is conserved, which means that we uniquely know what momentum is without even solving equations of motion, up to a sign. So, like, let's take an example, a nonlinear oscillator in a quartic potential. So then uh, it's very convenient to express the motion uh, as a line in phase space, right? So we have vertical axis momentum, horizontal x, and the particle has some kind of circular motion. It's not exactly a circle, it's, it's a, a constant energy curve. But anyway, the particle moves um, on, on, on uh, this well-defined orbit. So now uh, we can ask how stable this motion is. So uh, we can compare, we can take, for example, small nonlinearity. So suppose the potential is almost harmonic, but we had small nonlinearity. I took all the units to be one, like mass is one, frequency is one, but then there is dimension less nonlinearity epsilon. And then we can compare this motion. So this is, say, x of t. Uh, uh, for you know, regional nonlinear oscillator and linear oscillator. And we see that, of course, uh, we accumulate a mistake. So, but now we can actually develop perturbation theory, and we'll talk a bit later about it. So you, many of you probably know about stationary perturbation theory in quantum mechanics, but there is nothing quantum about perturbation theory. You can develop it for classical systems. So you can uh, get uh, 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 a beta Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, and uh, if you do this perturbation theory, you'll see much better motion. I, as I said, I will mention where this expression comes from. So now if we correct for epsilon for the Hamiltonian, so the Hamiltonian, as you see, is still uh, extremely simple. It has same orbits. So it's, it's a function of same H naught. So it's basically harmonic oscillator and harmonic oscillator squared. Uh, which means that you can still write all analytic expressions for how the particle moves and so on. And then if you look into better motion, the blue line, you see much better description of actual dynamics. But now if you wait for the long time, it's the same plot, but now time is much longer, then even this will break down. Just because our period is not exactly the same. And if you, you see a mess, but basically after a while, all lines become everywhere. So you cannot really predict accurately using approximations where the particle is. So, but then, of course, you can do even better approximation, better approximation, and then you can improve, improve, and improve. So, but after a long time, uh, even for this deterministic picture, actually, uh, we can uh, 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 predict much better not precise position of the particle, but it's stationary distribution, so where the particle is. So if you think about this, imagine that uh, I, I have a classical description of, say, electron in an atom, and it moves extremely fast. So, and uh, when I do measurements, I basically take, say, a photograph of this electron. But because it moves so fast, I essentially perform it in a random time. So the stationary distribution will be obtained if I do like many, many photographs at random times and see where electron is. And then the only information I can get that it's somewhere on this orbit, right? Then uh, suppose I measure only coordinate, then I can ask what is the coordinate distribution. And if you think about like intuitively, uh, it's more likely to find electron or particle when it's slow, right? Because when particle moves fast, it goes through this point very quickly. So you, there are small chances you will detect it on your camera. But when particle is slow, so it's near turning point, then there is much higher chance that you will see it, right? So, and if you think about this, probability is proportional to time, which is spent by the particle in a given point in space, and this is inversely proportional to velocity. So then the stationary probability distribution immediately is one over square root of E minus V, right? Because this is velocity. So, but if you think about this, this is nothing but microcanonical distribution in statistical mechanics. 
So this is, again, the simple example. There is no chaos, and we only do time averaging. So we deal with particle at a fixed energy, so the relevant distribution is microcanonical. Right? The particle always have the same energy. And I assume all of you uh, know this, that microcanonical distribution tells us that particles equiprobable everywhere on the constant energy surface, right? So let's see how it works. So uh, probability of coordinate is a marginal, right? So we need to take microcanonical distribution and integrate over momentum. And then we will find what's the probability of coordinate. But you all know that if I integrate delta function, I need to divide by derivative. And derivative of p squared is p, which is basically it's p over m because p squared over 2m is p, and it differentiates p over m, which is velocity. So you get 1 over velocity, absolute value of velocity, to be more precise. So we see that actually this 1D systems are ergodic. And then we can ask the same question. What will be mistake in my stationary distribution? So now I compare harmonic motion, nonlinear potential. And this is like a hist two histograms, P of x for harmonic motion and nonlinear potential for the same nonlinearity I showed before, 0.1. And you barely see the difference. So again, uh, 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 I, I just want to stress that uh, uh, the perturbation theory in quantum mechanics is more robust not because it's quantum, but because we deal with stationary states. Analog of stationary state is not a phase space point. It's, it's a probability distribution. I'll come to that microcanonical probability distribution. So for these distributions, we are much more robust. So we see that if we abandon the idea that we need to know precisely where the particle is, and we only want to know uh, uh, what's it, what it is doing after a long time, then uh, we have much more stable situation, even in these systems which are not chaotic. So, and then you can convince yourself it's not just time uncertainty. It's uncertainty in anything, because usually, yeah. So I'll come to this, so in one dimension, so, yes, you get ergodicity just for one particle, uh, which is not chaotic. But in higher dimensions, I'll come to that, you will need chaos, yes. Yeah. So now you can convince yourself that it's not only uncertainty in time which leads to the same result. Usually, we deal with ensembles of particles, right? We, uh, again, if we study maybe one macroscopic pendulum, it's not the case, but if you study I don't know, many small systems, like atoms, even if they are classical, so the quantum mechanics is not important, we very often deal at least with ensembles of particles. And these particles have, have slightly different masses, slightly different Hamiltonians, right? So we can say half, some particles have slightly different magnetic field than some other particles, right? Uh, and uh, all these things lead to loss of uh, precise position of the particle. So this is the word decoherence, which many of you hear. It's actually a workshop on open systems. So decoherence does not necessarily come from the fact that you have environment, but simply from the fact that you have many particles, and they're somewhat different. Different Hamiltonians, different masses, so you can have different clocks, different initial conditions, so anything different. And if you go through the same line of arguments, you will see that stationary distributions are much more robust. So precise uh, dynamics is very fragile. And this is, by the way, the reason why you know, quantum computers are much less stable, at least in my opinion, not, not because they're quantum, but because they try to deal with time-dependent information. It's much harder to, to control. Okay, so now let's try to, actually coming back to the question, let's not try to increase the complexity. And now, I will have either two particles, so one particle in two dimensions. It's uh, how you uh, treat it. But these particles are not interacting. And since they don't know anything about each other. So the Hamiltonian is uh, sum of the Hamiltonians. And of course, there are two separate uh, conserved quantities. And uh, those who, who like experts, you know that conservation laws are related to symmetries. I wonder if anyone can tell me what the symmetry is here. 
there is an extra symmetry in the system. I am not assuming that V1 and V2 are related, so it's not like rotation of X and Y and so on, but there is still an extra symmetry which leads to conservation. Huh? Sorry, I cannot hear. Yes, but you have two energies. Anyway, it's a bit subtle. You have two time translational symmetries because you can introduce a separate time for X Hamiltonian and Y Hamiltonian. Anyway, so, and two Hamiltonians, you know, Hamiltonian is, is related to time translation. Anyway, you have two energies which are separately conserved. And then if you go through the same argument which I gave, if you do time averaging, actually you will not end up in thermal equilibrium, right? So I will get in the product of microcanonical distributions for X coordinate and Y coordinate. So we'll still get a stationary state which is still will be pretty robust against uh, fluctuations which keep Hamiltonian separable. Now I want to, 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 to be more careful. But this is not a correct statistical ensemble. So it often happens. You start from something simple, everything works, you're happy, you make the next step and suddenly everything fails. So, and uh, this is actually a generic situation in integrable uh, systems. So systems with extensive, with many conservation laws, usually as many as number of degrees of freedom. Uh, so we basically have like each degree of freedom separately thermalizes. And this is why actually after a long time, the systems are less predictable than ergodic. You need more information to describe them. It's not just enough to tell what the energy of the system is. You really need to say what's the separate energies are. So in some sense, the systems are much simpler we can solve equations of motion. At the same time, they're much harder because we need much more information to describe uh, even the long time state. Okay, so now let's try to make the uh, situation even harder, uh, even more complex. And let's imagine that our potential includes interaction. So it's some function of X and Y. So now, what do we do? Well, energy conservation allows us to find magnitude of momentum still. I will assume that mass is isotropic just to, to simplify things, but not the direction. So direction we cannot solve from this. And there are no like other conservation laws, if we say arbitrary, uh, which will help us. So we cannot really say what the momentum is as a vector without solving equations of motion. So and this is a big difference with one dimension. So what do we do? And here it uh, comes as actually a very old philosophical principle called principle of uh, indifference, which I think, according to what I read, originates to Bernoulli, but I'm pretty sure it has all the history, maybe not mathematically formulated. It's like th there is a standard joke about I don't know, some stupid people. You ask them, what's the probability there is an elephant outside? And you say it's 50%. Why? Because it's either there or not there. But it turns out that this stupid principle is actually well mathematically formulated. And this, this is example of principle of indifference, which tells us that if we know nothing about our system, that's what we should apply. But then we can try to bias this principle a little bit. So like with the elephant, you can ask like where you are. If you are in India, it's one answer. If you are somewhere in North Pole, and another answer, right? So same here, you start, uh, 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 if you apply this principle to physics, you're just saying that without any extra knowledge, we just assign equal probabilities to all outcomes. And this is actually the principle of maximal entropy. And we know that it works. So uh, in uh, this particular situation, it actually this principle leads to microcanonical ensemble because we know that energy is conserved. So we know that for a given particle, uh, uh, if we look into time average probability distribution, it should always have the same energy. And then we'll say, well, let's assign probabilities randomly within this energy shell. And this is your microcanonical ensemble. So it sounds like a stupid principle, but it actually works very well. 
So uh, let's see through more like refined argument why this is expected answer. And I uh, learned it first when I was a student myself from uh, uh, the book of Landau Lifshitz, where it was so kind of written as obvious, but you know, all subtle things there, as I stated, is obvious. So anyway, so I'll try to go through the proof and maybe I'll ask someone, uh, of course students only, uh, to say where the mistake in this proof is. So let me, um, not mistake, subtlety. I mean, it's not a wrong point. It's, uh, well, mathematically it's wrong, of course, but physically it's, it's, it's not entirely wrong. So let's imagine that we start from a given uh, initial condition and then we evolve uh, our particle in time according to, say, Newton's or Hamiltonian's equations of motion. And then we formally define stationary distribution as time average of my instantaneous distribution. At any given moment, my distribution is a delta function because particle always has a well-defined position, right? So then I do time average. Of course, I can introduce some broadening into delta function and so on, but this is not, not the issue. Now, this is the argument which, which I, I learned from, uh, first from Landau Lifshitz. So the stationary distribution, and this is indeed very easy to show uh, that uh, if you do this time averaging, this probability becomes stationary since it stops changing in time. You can imagine it if you have bounded motion and you start doing photographs after a while, and then you average over these photographs. After a while, you'll go to some stationary profile. It's very easy to, to show when t goes to infinity. I think I forgot to divide by t, it's anyway, time average. If time goes to infinity, this distribution is stationary, it stops changing in time, which mathematically means that it has vanishing Poisson bracket with Hamiltonian, right? In quantum language, vanishing commutator. That's what stationary means. Well, because it has a vanishing Poisson bracket, the argument says that it should be a function only of conserved quantity. But in this example, I'm assuming there are no conservation laws, no symmetries, except for energy. So it should be a function of H. But H is the same as energy, because I consider particle at one point, right? It's always the same. So the only distribution I can get is microcanonical, right? because energy is fixed. So from this argument, I derived uh, this uh, microcanonical distribution, right, that the particle, uh, as I already mentioned several times, um, has equal probability to be at any point. And this is like principle of maximal ignorance and so on. And then uh, uh, I ask questions only to students, not to postdocs or faculty. So where's the, what's wrong with this argument? If, if, if it would be right, and I want to say it's not completely wrong. It actually works in many, many instances. But there is something missing. So again, now step number one, we just say let's consider time average. So, yes. Uh, yes, yes, I understand. But so far, you see, I didn't talk about chaos or not chaos. I just, uh, the argument is that I start at one point and I do time average of my distribution. I don't really know uh, uh, what equations of motion are, whether they lead to chaos or not. Of course, at the end, it's going to be important. I mean. But for now, I'm, I'm just asking, where's the mistake in the argument? So I do time average. So basically, I think about this. I do many, many photographs and plot a histogram where I see the particle, right? So this is mathematically time average of this delta function, right? Then I'm saying that this distribution, if time goes to infinity, it stops changing in time. And this you can prove mathematically for any bounded motion. The proof is actually very simple. So in the sense that if you take this distribution and evolve x and p according to time, this distribution will be the same. 
So it's, it's time translation variant. Because it uh, doesn't change in time, it should be a function of only conserved quantities. And the only conserved quantity is H. And then we arrived at this is a microcanonical distribution. Yeah. Yes, yes, you're right. Yes, this can happen. But suppose I'm in simpler. Suppose I have a situation like this. Yes, there could be subtle situations, indeed, that I can never go to the other side. Uh, but uh, then, at least this argument will tell you that you'll be microcanonical within connected phase space, right? So you, you talk about the situation when your phase space is disconnected. So, but even this is still not correct. Not always correct, let me correct myself. Yes. Yes. But I'm I'm just assuming that energy is conserved. I'm I'm arriving to the result that it should be uh, with the same energy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. One more. It's actually very subtle. I, I, I know like m many people say that this is a proof. Uh, so uh, I, actually, I'll, I'll get to this question. Don't worry. If you have any more ideas, just let me know. So now we kind of have two, if you want, conflicting ideas. I loosely saying Newton and, and then Laplace. But of course, there was no real argument between these people about this issue. But this is sort of an argument between, I would say, textbooks or like our you know, colloquial understanding of what's going on. So on the one side, we have determinism, right? So whatever the potential is, I will show some pictures for this particular potential. So we have x squared, y squared, nonlinearity. So we can solve equations of motion, and they have unique solution for a given initial condition, right? So and then we can find what exactly particle is doing, and then we can basically determine so our distribution uh, time average to not is actually always unique, right? On the other hand, we have another argument, just ignore equations of motion. They're complicated, they're hard to solve. Uh, just use energy conservation and uh, assign a probability distribution. So let's try to do like numerical simulation. So we take this potential and uh, we'll see what's going on. So while you see a picture, I'll explain what's plotted. So this is an equal energy surface. Because I have two particles, my phase space is four-dimensional. I, I don't know. I, I don't have a software which makes four-dimensional pictures. So it's a two-dimensional uh, motion. And what's plotted is equal energy surface. So it's basically a surface which particle can never cross, right? It's where momentum becomes zero, both x and y, right? So then I initialize the particle with zero velocity at one of these points. And then, uh, well, it's just computer solves the equations of motion. And this is for, sorry, for a small font, it's like a small nonlinearity 0.5. And if you look uh, very carefully, well, my distribution is not becoming microcanonical. You might say, well, maybe I don't wait long enough. But this is happening for as long as you can simulate. And actually, there are good reasons to believe that uh, this will continue forever. So it looks like Newton wins, and then you can imagine you can do the same game I was doing in 1D. You can solve first linear equations of motion for harmonic oscillator, then correct them, then maybe correct them more, and so on. Now let's try to increase nonlinearity. It's the same system, but now nonlinearity 4. And then that's exactly something which mentioned what you start to see that the motion becomes totally unpredictable. So just from this picture, you know that there is no way some analytic function will tell us what's going on. Right? The motion is completely crazy. Moreover, you just see that this motion starts looking like ergodic, right? My particles kind of go everywhere. So yeah, I forgot to say these two points are exactly two nearby initial conditions, the conditions which are displaced uh, very little. And moreover, you can see that even if you go to machine precision, you'll get the same story. It just will be delayed by very little in time. So and this is the answer to the question which I asked. So in the left picture, 
Well, it's a partial answer. It's, the story is much more interesting, more complicated. But the partial answer is that the left uh, picture is constrained by emergent conservation law, basically perturbatively dressed. You can think about this that at epsilon equals to zero, there are two conservation laws. So say angular momentum, you can say two energy, so you can say total energy and angular momentum, right? The system is rotational invariant. And then if you uh, uh, try to perturbatively correct, you will see that your second conservation law will not disappear completely. It will be modified. Yes, yes, I will come to that. Yes, 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 yeah, exactly. But let's see how it works. So, and I'll try to develop stationary perturbation theory for classical systems. So let me take, uh, I'll start from one dimensional example again. So, and then uh, let me do the following trick. I will introduce complex phase space variables. So instead of X and P, it's a kind of suggestive from this picture. I will say that P is like imaginary part of some complex number, and X is a real part. Of course, if you remember quantum mechanics, these are analogs of creation annihilation operators. But there is no H bar, and they're not operators. They're just complex numbers, A and A star. So I need to introduce these factors, square root of m omega and square root 1 over m omega, just to make dimensions the same. Right, because if I went to want to add X and IP, I need to make sure they have the same dimensionality. And factors of two are just from convenience. Again, apart from H bar, uh, these are your creation annihilation operators. But these are my complex variables. And then if I do reverse transformation, then essentially I will say that X will be real part of A and P is imaginary part of A. Right? So obviously I don't lose any information. I have same number of variables. Now I can ask, what are the Poisson brackets using these variables? I know, hopefully, I assume that everyone knows it. So in XP, it's like d by dx, d by dp minus opposite. So now it's a very simple uh, calculation. I'm not doing it. And by the way, I want to apologize. I will skip some derivations, because otherwise I won't go too far. So, but for those who see it for the first time, it's, it's actually a good exercise. Uh, so you can check that Poisson bracket in terms of these complex variables looks almost the same. It's like this um, uh, skewed symplectic derivative with respect to A and A star, but there is extra factor of I. And now if you are quick, you can actually see that Poisson bracket between X and P in this way will be exactly one as you want, right? Because, for example, DX, DA will be one over square root, DB, uh, DP, DA star, will be plus i times square root of omega over 2. m omega will cancel, you'll get 1 half. And from this, you'll get another 1 half, so you'll get 1. Okay. So now, uh, hopefully, remember that equations of motion for any function of x and p, that d, any function dt, is Poisson bracket of this function with uh, it again comes from if you have function of x and p, not of time, so in the sense that I always have to, at each moment of time I'm looking into the same function, x squared, x plus ip, whatever x power 4, then you can say it's like d function dx dx dt plus d function dp dp dt, and then dx dt is dh dp and so on, so you get a Poisson bracket. So now I can ask uh, what happens uh, with my Hamiltonian and then uh, again, you probably all took quantum mechanics. You know that Hamiltonian in terms of these variables is very simple, omega A star A. There is no H bar because it doesn't appear in definition of A, but it's the same thing. So now if you uh, uh, check what equations of motion for A, we'll see dA dt is omega A. So my solution is just rotation. And this is exactly rotation in the phase space. So, but now with these coordinates for harmonic oscillators, I brought it to a circle. So I basically renormalized my axis that my motion is, is in circles. It's very simple. Now let me go to my nonlinear oscillator, and then I, I look into nonlinear term. Remember, it's a plus a star with some factors. And then if you take a plus a star power of four, then you will get this, right? A star power of four plus this binomial coefficients and so on. 
So, so far I didn't do anything, but now let me do what we do uh, always in perturbation theory. So we'll go to rotating frame. So essentially, I know that due to this first term, uh, my A rotates quickly, so I will do this transformation. A goes to A times C to the I omega T. And again, it's a very simple exercise to see that if you plug now this into your Hamiltonian equations of motion, the first term will simply disappear. But there is a price to pay, and the price to pay that my A becomes now time dependent. And now if we look into this perturbation, you will see that all the terms oscillate in time, except for this one. Because this contains same number of A star and A. So again, if you're familiar with quantum harmonic oscillator, it's number conserving term, or if you want angular momentum conserving term. And then we will say that, okay, so if these terms are small and they oscillate in time, we can just ignore them in the first approximation. And then actually you recover this Hamiltonian which I mentioned in the early slides. So it's really, you see, it's one line calculation in this language. So, and this is a Hamiltonian obtained within rotating wave approximation. Uh, then you can actually go beyond that using like Floquia theory. I'm not going to talk about this. I don't know if there are talks this, but you can, if you develop a prop, a, appropriate Floquia theory, you will recover exactly perturbation theory for energies and so on. And then uh, this I'm saying without the proof, but you can sort of uh, believe me that in each order, uh, you will see that uh, this rotating approximation is a, can be written as a function of h naught, a function of n. So there is emergent, emergent integrals of motion, n, which is a, or h naught, which is a star a and h rotating. But here, of course, they're not independent because h rotating is itself as a function of n. So I, I uh, well, I just corrected my equations of motion. But now let's try to do it for a two-dimensional oscillator, which is harder. So I do the same thing, but now I have two pairs of complex variables for x1 and x2. So oh, I used x1, x2, and here xy, I apologize. I, I was copying from different parts. Anyway, uh, I have x and y as an earlier slide. And then if you do rotating wave approximation, you will arrive to, uh, it's the same idea. You will get to the Hamiltonian, uh, which of course has this non-perturbed part, but also has a half perturbed part which only contains same number of A's and A stars. They could be A, X, and Y for the same reason because everything else will oscillate and average. And now, if we stare at this expression, we will realize that it still has a conserved operate. Obviously, H rot Hamiltonian itself is conserved, but also N total number of particles is conserved. But now, this Hamiltonian H rotation is not a function of N. So this term is not a function of, of this number because it contains like AX star, EY, and so on. So this is now a new conservation law which we obtained in first order of perturbation theory. And now we can do simulations. This is some epsilon point three, and we can see that indeed it works. So if we look into NX and NY, we see they are not, and without, if the system is linear, both NX and NY separately conserved, right? This is like energy X, energy Y. But the moment we introduce nonlinearity, we see this conservation law breaks down, actually very quickly. So they start to oscillate. But now if I look into the sum of them, it actually has, it's much better conserved. It has very, very small oscillations. And actually, I can keep going. I can improve this. If I use Floquia theory, I can improve this conservation law even more, and I will get smaller oscillations. So, uh, and again, you can show that in any fixed order of perturbation theory, you get two conservation laws. Yes? Exactly, it's a canonical transformation, yes using these variables, exactly. Yeah, there is nothing quantum about Bogolubov transformation. Yeah, absolutely. Which is number conserving in terms of new variables. Yeah, Bogolubov transformation mixes A and A star. 
but you still have canonical. So Bogolubov transformation is canonical transformation, which preserves now Poisson bracket between this A and A star, which has to be I. And this is actually unitary rotations. So there is no quantum mechanics, but all unitary rotations preserve this Poisson bracket. It's, yeah, you are right. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm coming there. So each order of perturbation theory doesn't care about nonlinearity. So in each fixed order, you actually get a second conservation law. And I like this example because we know, we just discussed, if you have two conservation laws, you cannot have chaos, right? So, and then we learn something very interesting from this example. It's, it's um, uh, because we just saw a picture that chaos can happen, right? We know it can happen. And it turns out that this expansion are almost always asymptotic. In a sense, they are not convergent. They have zero, strictly zero radius of convergence. And I don't know exactly about this problem, but most certainly it also has a zero radius of convergence. Yes? Yes? So then I do the following trick. I, um, uh, I remove this by going to time dependent AX and AY. So my AX and AY oscillate in time. And then you can see when you differentiate, maybe I'll just write down. It's very easy to see. Uh, I don't see any chalk. Oh, here, sorry. Fine. So suppose you introduce A tilde, which is like A times E to the I omega T. I hope my signs are right. If they're wrong, then maybe minus I omega T. Should be. Uh, and then uh, I have I D A tilde D T, right? So I want to find what it is. And then it will be I D A D T times E to the minus I omega T plus omega D A tilde D T. So, uh, sorry, by omega A tilde, I apologize. So, but this term will appear also uh, in the Hamiltonian when they have dH d uh, A star, right? So this term will cancel. And if you remember your quantum perturbation theory, that's exactly what you are doing. You're just doing transformation such that without perturbation, your, well, there it's coefficient of expansion of wave function doesn't oscillate. So once you do it, you see that you effectively have Hamiltonian without the first term, right? I reinserted it back because it corrects the energy, but sort of it doesn't appear in equations of motion. There are some subtleties between frame transformations, but let's say it's not there. Just pretend that it's not there. So now you have a Hamiltonian, which is purely nonlinear, right? It's quartic and A and A star. And it's small, in a sense, it's proportional to epsilon. But on top of that, some of the terms are oscillating. So you have, and they are fast oscillating, right? Because now in this rotating frame, dynamics is set by epsilon. Omega is gone, right? So this omega is actually fast frequency. It's much faster than uh, dynamics I know, it's much bigger than epsilon, right? So then what you can say, and, and here I'm using words, but there is Floquia theory, periodic, theory of periodically driven systems behind. Uh, so there is actually a very nice problem about Kapitza pendulum in, in, in landau lifshitz motion in fast oscillating field. So uh, they uh, go, go through this in detail. So what you can do in the first approximation is just ignore fast oscillations. And if you ignore it, only this term remains. If you do next order of expansion, you will kind of get various commutators between remaining terms. But you will, in each order, you will see that number of A stars and A's will be always the same. If you do correct high frequency expansion. So this N should be conserved, but there are some caveats. This N, you have to correct all your variables, so this Anyway, and will be modified as well. Let me put it this way. So it's not that 
a star a plus a, whatever this n is conserved, so you'll get corrections. Like you're getting correction to h rotating, but you also get corrections to n. But you will get conservation law in each order. So all terms which you see appear as a function of epsilon over omega squared. Actually, this is a good exercise. If you do quantum perturbation theory, so you just start from some state with some energy and, and just find leading order correction uh, to this term, you will actually recover this expression. So this, this is literally uh, identical to stationary perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. But you are not doing it for individual eigenstates, but for the whole Hamiltonian. I don't know if I answer your question. OK, so another standard example of, of chaos is kick trotter. So, and, and uh, this is known as standard map. So uh, we basically have uh, just free motion of the particle and periodically turn on gravitational field, like cos and phi potential. So in the equations of motion, extremely simple. So between the periods, I don't have any potential. So I have a free motion. So it means that. Uh, P is a constant, and phi uh, gets, is increased proportionally to its velocity or momentum in this case. And at this moment, because you have a delta function, kick it so fast and coordinate doesn't have time to change, but momentum gets a kick, right? It's very easy to see. And this is called like a standard map. And this is what's going to happen uh, according to Scholarpedia, so someone else long time ago did these calculations, and these are these phase space portraits for, for the system uh, for different values of k or different values of the period. And then you see uh, a very similar story. So if, if kick strands is small, so basically each time you add momentum a little bit, it's almost like a continuum for system. So instead of discrete equations of motion, you can right, continuous equations of motion, the energy conserving, and so on. And then you just see you have very, very nice orbits. And as you increase k, then you start to get a mass, and eventually it again becomes basically ergodic. Uh, but uh, you actually see that uh, uh, expansion, which I, I was sort of advocating or, uh, when applied to this system, cannot be exact. Because if you have exact conservation law, we cannot get chaos. But even here, for the small kick, you start to see like a bit of noise here. So the systems become chaotic. And here you can see it even more visibly. It's not ergodic, but yet it's chaotic. And this tells us that uh, this construction cannot be exact. So we can maybe get some approximate conservation laws, but not exact conservation. And there is a famous theorem in mathematics, which I honestly, I, I don't really understand, so the proof is far too complicated for me. But uh, this is sort of the statement. It's um, Kolmogorov Arnold Moser theorem, very famous, which basically tells us that in classical, finite dimensional classical systems, uh, actually ergodicity under some conditions that is the, no degeneracy, so on. Actually, my previous example has degeneracy, so it doesn't uh, belong to this theorem. Uh, but still, it says that uh, under some mathematical conditions, ergodicity doesn't happen right away. So basically, a weak perturbation preserves almost all tori. So I just showed in integrable systems, you have the motion along the tori. So, and this is like uh, actual video I found. This is Vladimir Arnold, like, uh, uh, and I like to tell this story. So this is Kapitza Pendulum. And the story is that he was in, in, in committee for uh, uh, Olympiads, high school Olympiads in, in Soviet Union. And uh, the head of this committee was Kapitsa. And uh, Kapitsa was yeah, head, and he was deputy. Of course, Arnold was responsible for mass. And then Kapitsa told him about this funny story that uh, uh, for you know, his experiment, he had to solve this problem that if you have an oscillator and start shaking it, like in this picture, uh, then you can stabilize upside down motion. And Arnold said that he didn't believe Kapitza because he saw that there is no theorem in mathematics which tells you that this motion should be stable. And according to his words, on the way to home, he figured out that actually their own theorem, which we developed, might apply to this. And then he, uh, 
uh, worked it out and actually found that indeed the theorem applied and they can prove the stability of this motion. And then uh, he was very challenged by Kapitza. Kapitza used sw uh, su uh, sorry, uh, uh, a swinger and a sewing machine to, to, to uh, demonstrate it. And then uh, Arnold made his own experiment with a razor. He even says that first time it failed, and he redid all these calculations and figured out that his pencil was too long, and then he cut it by four centimeters, and then it worked. Anyway, but coming back to what I was saying, so you see the same story. You start to see, like, if you start shaking, the face space portrait becomes really mixed. So now back to this 2D example, we see that uh, uh, if you look into probability distribution just by counting, um, uh, again, how many times uh, a point visits a particular uh, particle, visits a particular point in phase space. Now it's a coordinate representation. Uh, you can see that uh, at, at this large nonlinearity, I guess the same number four, which I showed before, you can show that it approaches ergodic distribution. So it's very easy to check that microcanonical ensemble in 2D is very special distribution uh, of, of coordinates is a theta function. And since it's always the same where the motion is allowed. It's kind of property of two dimensions. So we see that chaos leads to ergodicity. Okay, so now after this long introduction, let me go to quantum systems. So what do we do? So there is no notion of trajectories. So we cannot define you know, Lapunov exponents or how sensitive trajectories are. And uh, uh, it's actually a long quest how you properly define chaos, and there is also long history, long attempts. So let me mention uh, some, um, uh, not in historical order, but some of them. So one possibility is that let's try to define an object which is sensitive to Lapunov exponents in the classical limit. Right. So, but this object should be defined quantum mechanically. So I cannot say distance between trajectories, right? Because I don't know what trajectory is. And then the ideas came actually from early work of Larkin and Avchinnikov, and they go under the name of OTOC, out of time order correlation function. And the original idea was, yeah, and then basically there was a lot of uh, activity uh, starting from Kitaev and Moldesena works and so on. I'm not really going into that direction, but let, let me still uh, mention what these objects are. So uh, they had an idea that let's try to look into a strange object of commutator squared of some observable at time t and time zero. I just chose momentum randomly. It could be any observable. So, and then if you open the brackets, commutator squared, then it's, it's an easy exercise. You'll get four terms. And I just want to highlight that these terms appear in kind of strange order in time. So that's the name. Like in particular, get t, then 0, t, and 0. So and if you try to write a Feynman pass integral approach, you'll see that time increases, decreases, increases, decreases. And there is no way that can, time can increase. So you cannot really rearrange your uh, contour. And because of this, these correlation functions don't have causal representation. So they don't appear anywhere in linear response. So you know that usually correlation functions appear as dissipation, Kubus susceptibility, nonlinear susceptibility, and so on. So this type of, fun of correlation functions don't appear. But they are sensitive to Lyapunov exponent. Why? Because in the classical limit, we know that commutator becomes a Poisson bracket up to factor of h bar. And you remember what's the Poisson bracket between two functions. If one of them is p, it's just d first, uh, uh, dx, d second, dp, which is zero minus opposite. Yes? Oh, this is some initial state. Yeah, you can, so if you want to have classical analogy, actually this is an important thing. You want psi zero to be localized in phase space point. So this could be say coherent state. If you want to be, it's like analog of phase space point, right? So basically, here the logic that you take an object which, is com which has well-defined classical limit and which is sensitive to this uh, Lyapunov exponent, and um, uh, uh, then you see why uh, 
uh, it should be sensitive to this Lyapunov exponents because what is dp dt over dx0? This is precisely how momentum at time t will change if you have infinitesimal change in coordinate at time zero, right? So we know that in the classical limit, it should diverge with twice the Lyapunov exponent, twice because it's squared, right? Sorry, can you speak? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, uh, this is average of initial probability distribution. So if you want a semi-classical limit, it would be Wigner function corresponding to psi naught. This is the best classical analog, right? So normally for uh, uh, classical systems, we take one trajectory and there is no average. But if I want to take here a classical limit, I have to put a bar because what will happen is average of a distribution, Wigner function corresponds to psi naught. And if I have coherent state, it's almost phase space point, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah. Why take the square of the commutator? Oh, because if you take a linear, it's a, a good question. If you don't square the commutator, on average, you'll get zero. Because when you start, usual commutator will appear in Kubo susceptibility, and Kubo susceptibilities are never big. And the reason is that if you start from even narrow probability distribution, you'll get lots of cancellations. You'll have some trajectories which will go one way, some another, and when you average, there will be nothing exponential. Square means that you always have positive numbers. You average over positive numbers. Yes, that's a very good question. Oh, I think I missed something. Um, yeah, thanks for asking questions. So um, it turns out, and this was uh, figured out uh, um, by uh, Boris Fine first, that actually you can get similar sensitivity to OTOC and actually mathematically equivalent uh, object if you kind of study echo. So basically, if you start in his uh, work, which I'll show briefly, you start from some, say, magnetized state, so state with magnetization, you evolve forward in time, you do small perturbation, evolve backward in time, it's like reverse Hamiltonian. And then you compare uh, magnetization you got with initial magnetization. And it's intuitively clear, if you are chaotic, you, you should, uh, it should disappear. You start from magneti magnetized state in, in situation where in equilibrium there is no magnetization. Anyway, so what you can show after some work is that this echo is equivalent to, to this Poisson bracket square, so this is physical, but it also shows it's a bit weird, right? So you need, in order to measure it, you need to reverse uh, time. And uh, this is an example from a paper uh, by, by uh, Victor Galitsky group, 2017, who studied same kick trotter, and they introduced very small H bar, and they basically studied this object uh, and compared it with uh, classical. There are many curves, I'm not really going into details, but let me just say, so what's plotted are Lyapunov exponents, one obtained from this out of time order correlation function, one in a standard way. Uh, uh, so these are basically red circles and triangles. There is a small delay between them, but this is not even quantum effect because this is like averaging of exponent is not the same as exponent of the average. There is small difference between them. Anyway, so they agree uh, in the small h bar limit, so everything is good. So maybe we can use this as a definition of quantum chaos, but there is a problem. And I think, again, in the same paper I mentioned by Boris Fine, they, to be big surprise uh, to themselves, found that if you consider truly quantum model, so not the model which doesn't have classical limits, so I'll introduce those later, but think about spin one half spin chain. Right, so spin one half is always quantum, because just two states, even if you have 10 spin one halves or 100 spin one halves, it's still not a classical system. At least there is no obvious microscopic classical description, right? So, and then uh, if you take these two systems, he didn't see some sensitivity. So here I am showing precisely, uh, it's, it's from the plot, precisely this deviation of magnetization from initial value, which is this echo which should also go with twice Lyapunov exponent. So it's basically OTOC. And this is for classical spins. And then you just see as a function of time, it's exponential. So you just see you have linear scale in time and logarithmic or exponential scale in, in this deviation. 
But now they did the same numerical experiment for a quantum system, and this is nothing exponential. It's not just curve, but look into numbers. So numbers barely change, right? So here you have many orders of magnitude, and here, well, it's just, say, one order, but over a much longer time. So, and then um, uh, later there was a proof, actually, by, by Tamash uh, here and his group, that if you have local uh, systems with um, local interactions and local Hilbert space dimension, so it's like spin one half, so uh, then uh, you have at most polynomial growth. So this idea just doesn't work. And I don't think people found a way around. No, it's even not that. So Holstein, you can use Holstein Primakov. That the problem is that you cannot replace commutators with Poisson brackets in your equations of motion. If you take large S limit, then it will work for the time which scales log S. So actually, you need very, very big S to see exponential behavior because this time, it's called Ehrenfest time, is actually very small. So, but beyond that, you just cannot. There is not enough room because at short times, you always have some perturbation, and loosely speaking, at short times, you already have large quantum fluctuations. And at long times, you kind of reach one. So there is no room for exponential growth. And classically, there is a room, because you can start from something very, very localized. Yes, so th there are exceptions. I, I'm not going like SYK model and so on, but at least my understanding, even for the, it's, it still has large N, uh, but uh, my, at least we tested it for like um, uh, uh, infinite temperature states, it's still the same. So it seems that, at least I don't know a single counter example when you have exponential behavior, which is not described by saddle point, and saddle point equations always have Hamiltonian structure. So you basically write any pass integral, you have some large n parameter, large n, large s, small h bar, whatever, saddle point parameter. So if you take saddle point equations, you will get uh, classical equations, in the sense you'll get Poisson brackets, and they always describe this exponential growth. I, I don't know counter examples, but I also don't know proof, maybe Tamash knows, I, I don't know proof which mathematically says that it should be the case. In, in, in space, I, I, I guess Tamash is here, but nearest neighbors are local, so I don't know how fast they should decay. Exponentially decaying is probably local. We need some Lee Robinson bound, so I think people argue that Lee Robinson apply for power, power law interactions with power bigger than something, but depending on dimensionality, but I don't know exactly, exactly remember. Yeah. Sorry, can you speak loud? Oh, Los yeah. It's also, uh, uh, like, in, in short, uh, people tried it, but somehow it, it, it ca cannot be uh, used to, to, to distinguish chaos. There, there are many other probes. I will talk also a little bit about operator growth, maybe, but it also didn't work. I don't know if I'll have time. So people try it. I I'll come to that because, of course, I. I Hope we have at least some positive answer to the question how you can uh, unite quantum and classical chaos in a single framework. So hopefully I will reach maybe tomorrow at that point. Yeah. How I write auto where? Sorry. Correlation function? Yes. Uh, well, Keldish formally is just pass integral representation of this correlation function. But yes, formally, just think about it. So you start from some state, uh, 
it's actually better to be that this, eigen, uh, this is eigenstate of your operator which you measure, say magnetization, for various reasons, close to eigenstate. Then you evolve it in time, up to time t, and then do you do infinitesimal unitary with, say, perturbation b. Then you reverse Hamiltonian and come back. And now you have two operators, what you measure and with what you perturb. And it turns out that in this case, uh, when your unitary rotation is small, so you can expand it. So suppose epsilon is a rotation angle. So if you expand an epsilon, then this will map exactly to out of time order correlation function of between these operators M and B with what you measure and what you perturb. Yeah, and then you can do Keldish contour and so on. Okay, so we, I would say, as community generally failed with chaos, quantum chaos, I just showed one example, but how about thermalization or ergodicity? So, and there, actually, uh, the progress was much better. So, uh, in starting from 90s, so let me again start from basics. So, now I, I give up the idea of looking into trajectories, how chaotic and so on, but I want to ask, after a long time, will I, my system be described by thermal equilibrium or not? And how I can reconcile it with quantum mechanics? And actually, there were many years of frustration uh, when people thought about this problem from the early days of quantum mechanics. Like von Neumann was probably one of the first people who started thinking about this. And the apparent paradox is, 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 is here. So our evolution, quote unquote, is linear. I, I kind of really don't like this language because it's linear because we use Schrodinger representation. Um, but let me uh, not go into these details. So in a sense, I can take any wave function, initial state, expand in the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and then my motion is very simple, just the oscillate in time, right? So I have many harmonic oscillators. Now let's look into some observable and look into expectation value of this observable. And then, um, well, I will get a double sum, and then I will get, of course, these oscillating terms and matrix elements of the observable. And this is called density matrix, this object, right? And now I will ask, I know, in weak sense, I will ask uh, whether my time average will thermalize. Exactly I was asking um, in the beginning. And then, well, time average, I was assumed that I have generic system with no degeneracies and so on, then all oscillating terms will average to zero, right? And then what I will see that out of this sum, I will get only diagonal elements of rho which remain. And then it's actually for Neumann, uh, as I mentioned, was first to realize that if you want to reconcile this language, quantum language, with which I can describe also classical systems, right? I just have complicated states, but many. Then somehow ergodicity should be encoded in the structure of eigenstates. Because you see, uh, uh, if you don't say it, there is like a problem because these diagonal elements of rho, which are just basically mod c and squared, they don't depend on time. So if I want my distribution to appear Gibbs distribution, there is some problem, or like microcanonical, because these probabilities, these are probabilities to occupy energy states, they're time independent. And there was a long uh, history behind, I'll mention some of it, uh, but um, uh, essentially uh, uh, the answer is that the eigenstates uh, encode all this information. So let me again start from some simple examples to, to, to illustrate how it works. So if, if you go to same one dimensional oscillator I started from, then I know that my stationary states are described by WKB. Right? So this, are, this is basically their structure. And if you remember WKB, if you average over these oscillations, this P of X, remember there's one of a square root of P appearing in place squared. So one over p uh, momentum. So this is exactly this microcanonical ensemble. So and this is a comparison uh, between microcanonical ensemble and quantum state. So if we average a little bit of oscillations, again for many reasons, like we have more than one state, or we have slightly different masses, slightly different anything, these oscillations will average. It will just reproduce microcanonical. So, and again, this situation uh, with stationary states is kind of simple in, in all integrable models. We can basically develop WKB in each direction. But in chaotic systems, uh, we have 
nasty orbits, so from this we kind of conclude there should be nasty eigenstates. So let's just see where the problems are. So suppose we have like two-dimensional potential now, and we, we need to solve a simple Laplace equation. Say if we have a billiard, then uh, my wave function should vanish at the boundary, right? So, and uh, actually people for many years tried to do it. And they were failing except for some special situation. And then uh, actually it's, it's uh, 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 Sir Michael Berry who came up with a you know, famous uh, conjecture that the Wigner function, which is basically a wave function squared in some sense, uh, this is uh, analog of probability distribution P of XP for quantum eigenstates approaches basically random superposition of plane waves. So the first random appeared here. So, uh, uh, and this is a numerical experiment, uh, also taken, I think, from Wikipedia. So this is one of chaotic cardioic billiards, and this is exact eigenstate. So this is, I forgot, is a real part or absolute value of squared, probably real part of wave function. And this is random superposition of plane waves roughly with the same energy. So you pick up plane waves from the microcanonical shell. And of course, the patterns are not the same because left is random, this is not random. But if you look visually, uh, they look pretty similar. So separately, uh, there were developments by, by Wigner Dyson who thought about totally different systems, not classical chaos at all, but, but some spectrum of nuclei. And they like uh, did the, from some uh, experimental observations, they eventually came up with, with um, an idea that maybe this nuclei is described by random matrices. So if you look into levels. Uh, there is also a long interesting story behind, but I think I will not cover uh, uh, anything uh, if I go into details. Let me just say uh, in words that the main uh, uh, feature of, of, of this uh, random matrix theory, or at least one of the main features, is that probability of level spacing uh, being small uh, is, is uh, approaches zero. And the reason is you can sort of see it from this picture. If you have two by two block and if these guys are random, then in order to energy difference to be zero, you need most real uh, diagonal part to be zero and off diagonal part to be zero. And moreover, if off diagonal part is complex, then it's even harder because you want both real part and imaginary to be zero. So you get more repulsion if you have uh, complex um, uh, Hamiltonians. And this should be contrasted with sort of naive expectation that we have random energy levels. If you have random energy levels, it's sort of like mosquitoes in the tent. You get Poisson distribution, uh, and which means that probability of level spacing is exponential. So, and uh, there are two powerful, I mean, people at the end connected all these ideas, and then there were two powerful conjectures. One has a name of, of uh, uh, Barry Tabor conjecture about generic integrable systems who say that our distribution is precisely Poisson. So if I take basically a generic means I don't have special degeneracies between uh, uh, energies. So, so they're integrable, but they don't have some extra symmetries. So in the conjecture that your energy uh, states um, uh, described by Poisson statistics, and uh, this uh, BGS by Higgs, Giannone, and Schmidt conjecture, who kind of generalized this Berry conjecture. Uh, and they said that uh, uh, for chaotic systems, I probably should say ergodic systems, uh, uh, the energy levels are described by random matrix statistics. Uh, basically, show how it works. So here is an example. Um, so we have uh, just square well potential, but with incommensurate. Well, so, so the, the, there is no rational number relation between x and y lengths. And then if you um, look into level spacing distribution, so basically you measure your, numerically measure your energy levels, you look into what's the distance between levels, and then you plot a histogram, right? You actually get very good approximation to the Poisson statistics. And if you consider a billiard, in this case, Sinai billiard, this is original uh, work by, by, uh, by Higgins, then you will see a uh, random matrix ensemble. So you see that 
probability of having very small level spacing is actually suppressed. And then, uh, of course, numerics got better, so people uh, studied uh, various examples, and they found that uh, this random matrix statistics for chaotic billiards works extremely well. So the better the numerics, the better the results. So even though this is a conjecture, but I think it's now completely accepted. So, and this is kind of surprising result, um, uh, at least on the first sight, because your original Laplace equation, it doesn't have any randomness. So, and then, uh, yeah, I guess I will finish with some overview for examples. I'll finish this lecture. So there were many, many tests of this conjecture. So this is original uh, heavy nuclear experiment. So these are level spacings between uh, different nuclei. Uh, I forgot exactly which, uh, but there are like more, almost 2,000 spacings. And uh, uh, they actually, this wigner dyson distribution uh, worked very well. Uh, then there is a hydrogen in, in, in uh, a strong magnetic field. We all know hydrogen atom. If you have small magnetic field, there is Zeeman effect and so on. But once we introduce strong magnetic field, actually the system becomes chaotic, ergodic. And you approach, if you go to high and higher in these units, you go basically to high and higher energies, closer and closer to unbound state. You actually get better and better description in terms of this wigner dyson distribution. This is a funny example, which I'll skip to save time. And, and then actually, uh, um, and after like, I don't know, 2008, uh, people started checking uh, many particle quantum spin systems. And this is one example from work of Leas Santens and uh, Gubin, uh, <coughs> uh, who considered a purely quantum system. So it's a spin chain. Uh, in this case, it's integral X, X, Z chain with a magnetic field in the center. And then they looked into level statistics as they increase magnetic field in the center, which makes the model chaotic or ergodic. And they also found that uh, uh, if, if this field is zero, model is integrable, you're close to Poisson statistics. You look into the same quantity, level spacing. But if it gets stronger, you are closer to Wigner um, uh, Dyson statistics. So this probe seems to work very well. And there were many, many other tests in other numerical systems. And uh, mostly, of course, one-dimensional spin chains, because that's what one can do numerically. And this, is, uh, this always works, uh, uh, at least when integrability breaking is strong. And, and this is considered, uh, this emergence of random matrix statistics considered a standard definition of quantum chaos. But again, I would rather say it's quantum rigidity. There is also a very interesting relation to uh, prime numbers and, and uh, zeros of uh, Riemann zeta function. But again, because we have five minutes left, I, I, I probably skip this. There's a very interesting story behind. But anyway, so prime numbers have something to do with uh, random matrix statistics. Let me put it this way. So um, uh, another manifestation of random matrix, uh, same thing, instead of level spacing, you use so-called spectral form factor. And again, like Tamash is uh, uh, an expert. He used this measure and uh, many other people too uh, for other things. So uh, this looks a bit, uh, so it doesn't, the advantage of this that um, and it, um, uh, uh, it only uses energies, doesn't really use eigenstates, and there is some measure, uh, uh, accumulative measure of energies. And basically, we define sort of a partition function, uh, sum of all energy states of these uh, exponents. And then you take a square of this function. You can introduce imaginary part if you want to, 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 to weight your energies with some temperature. So some low energy states can bigger weight and so on. But you can say that this beta is zero. So you just look into this squared. And then if you carefully go through random matrix prediction, so you will see that uh, if you average uh, this, again, over ensemble of random matrices, it will have uh, this function will increase, which is a bit surprising. Because if you think about it, you average this z of t, and you get many oscillating terms. And usually you think that uh, if 
time gets bigger, they oscillate more and more, and then they deface. But actual random matrices have this long-range correlations between energies. And because of these long-range correlations, this logic is not entirely true. And so what happens is that after this initial intuitive decay of this, you'll get a linear ramp. And uh, this uh, linear ramp is also taken as a manifestation of random matrix statistics. So, so. Oh, these are different times. Yeah, this, uh, this is particular, I mean, time scales. And usually, the, let me put it, there is always a short time which depends on the model. So this, I, I just stole a picture from internet. It's from SYK model. I intentionally didn't want to go into details. It, it will bring me very far. But essentially, you have a short time scale uh, at which everything decays. But then there is a typically, it's called tau -less time. It's tau -less time. It's basically when, uh, if you think about frequency space or energy difference space, your Hamiltonian starts behaving as a random matrix. And after that time, so for this model, it's of the order of one because it's not local. But for local models, this number, uh, this time, uh, this, I, I will come to that. Uh, so this is typically a diffusive time. So it's L squared over D. It's time when you start feeling boundary. So and after this time, you have basically unlimited ramp until you reach what's known as Heisenberg time, which is inverse level spacing. So if in thermodynamic limit, uh, if this time is finite, or at least this time at most polynomial, you can say it lasts forever. But you have to be careful. So this value is still much smaller than this value. So it's not like experimental probe, but it's good numerical probe. OK, see, I have two minutes left. Yeah, I think it's probably a good point to stop here. So that we are not late for the break. More questions? Yeah, it's a Hilbert space. I mean, you, it, it depends how you define it. It's whether you normalize it to 1 at t equals to 0 d squared. So in this way, it's normalized to 1 when time is equal to 0. Yes? So according to these uh, di different distributions of level, you can see that your quantum system is chaotic or it is um, non-chaotic, like maybe localized. If you take, say, a mean field approximation to your quantum system, this now gets back to a classical system, will you be getting the signature of classical cues in some way? Um, no, not necessarily, because, uh, you know, mean field approximation can be, for example, you know, one-dimensional, right? If your system is symmetric and so on. Uh, and uh, overall, I think this is a very interesting question, and to which level. So me, all mean field approximations kind of lose information, and they can lose information about chaos. So it now it depends. So mean field, again, we are talking more about dynamics. So mean field is uh, uh, usually classical approximation. So uh, in a sense that, again, you, you, you have few degrees of freedom, which are described by some you know, Poisson brackets and so on. Uh, but the situation could be even more subtle. Like, uh, for example, you can take integrable spin chain, and then you take this classical limit, several point approximation, and then you will get essentially equations describing classical spin chains with the same interactions. And those turn out to be non-integrable. Mm -hmm. So, and opposite is also true, I think. So, th this um, transition bet between quantum and classical chaos is the more subtle. So, some models, when you approach classical limit, it's bounded to be the same, right? Because if you say send h bar to zero, your saddle point approximation uh, becomes classical, but also 
quantum chaos or ergodicity is only defining the limit when h bar goes to zero. Because in a way, this is a symptotic statement. So finite two by two matrix, you cannot say it's chaotic or not, right? So you need more and more levels to say that as yes, you increase Hilbert space size, you approach, say, Wigner Dyson distribution. And if you approach classical limit at the same time when you increase Hilbert space size, typically this equivalent statements. So you get chaos in both, so ergodicity in both, so not chaos. Uh, but in other situations, when I guess mean field is less justified, uh, this is not the case. But overall, it could be very subtle, actually. Well, here, ballistic, I, I wouldn't say. So I don't know this model that well. So ballistic is of the order of one when you feel the boundary, but this is like completely non-local model, right? So in, in local models, ballistic will be like L. Uh, and uh, so if you want, this is time when information spread, so you know, entropy spread. But then uh, uh, they also call it diffusive. So here, I actually don't know whether it's n. So in local systems, it's uh, n squared. Uh, um, and usually, uh, this is uh, uh, when uh, I know, your conserved quantities start to fill boundary. So, so again, what is it in SYK model? I, maybe there are experts in the room who know. So these regions are specific to this SYK model? like. Yeah, for this one. For normal systems, you will see this, so ballistic will be like of the order of n, and, and diffusive will be of the order of n squared. Okay. So, right. Well, if our system is not ergodic, uh, are we allowed to use renormalization group to find the fixed point of our system? Renormalization group for what? For equilibrium? Or? To find the fixed points of our system. Uh, fixed points in what sense? So very often we talk about fixed points in equilibrium. So if you talk about, yeah, in equilibrium, actually chaos is much less important because you just assume you have equilibrium. You assume that there is a partition function uh, and so on. If you talk about dynamical fixed points, then it's sort of an open field. So people talk about pre as sort of fixed points, like generalized Gibbs ensembles and so on. So in, in this sense, yes, uh, you can use this notion. But I don't think it's defined in, in RG sense, like rigorously. So there are some words behind that um, you first, uh, there are papers by, by Berger and others that you first flow to like a stable distribution, which is fixed point. And numerically, you always, you often see like it's fixed point. If you look at the Fermi pasta Ulam problem, after a long time, it goes to some strange distribution, which is localized in time basically forever. And eventually, people believe it normalizes. And it's very particular distribution. I have no idea why it's stable. I mean, maybe there are experts who know it. But I'm not aware of any I don't know, mathematical renormalization group ideas which will predict what this way. You can say Kolmogorov turbulence is an example of this point. But again, there are some considerations why this is stable. I am not aware of like RG type equations which will tell us that you, you go to this. Uh, Yes. No, I'll try to get there. I mean, there were many confusions uh, among us, including myself, uh, like when we started. And there was like very, uh, uh, I don't know, ignorant. Uh, I don't want to use bad words, but uh, may maybe ignorant approach, like when you started looking and, into quantum chaos or gadicity, just thinking that uh, we can ignore like previous knowledge. So there is, uh, I I'm not going to talk about many body localization. I don't know if there are lectures or about this, but this is like an example of where like community failed. So there were many, irrespective of whether people believe it's localization or not basically, there were so, so many mistakes 
like so many misstatements about that. And part of the reason is because people were confusing chaos and ergodicity. These are not the same things. What happens that usually in thermodynamic limit, you are always ergodic for most. But if you look into finite system, and I'll come to that, and you ask how you go from integrable to ergodic regimes, you will go still through this phase, which is chaotic but not ergodic. And that's kind of the reason why I spend so much time discussing like, you know, chaos and ergodicity in classical systems. For ergodicity, no. Level, level spacing distribution does not tell you about chaos. It tells you about ergodicity, but ergodicity comes with chaos. So in this sense, you can say, yes, it's a diagnostic of chaos. And very often in literature, people define chaos like this. So if it's a definition, then of course you can say level spacing defi distribution defines chaos, so therefore systems are chaotic, which have this. But this is a tautology. If you define chaos, and I'll come to that, as unpredictability, then you can have perfect Poisson statistics, and yet you can be completely chaotic. Come to that. No, as I said, it doesn't work. I'll come to that either after the break or tomorrow. And I don't want to use definition, but this is basically the work we were doing for a long time. And I'll try to say through basically adiabatic transformations and long time response. So there. Uh, uh, classical or quantum again, you can define this complexity and then you can distinguish chaos, ergodicity, and integrability. But again, I don't want to use its definition because it's not really accepted, so my, some people might have different opinions. But uh, at least I will try to say how you can distinguish these three notions very well. Yeah, no, but this conjecture, um, uh, BGS conjecture in a way is wrong about chaos because this is like a long problem. If you take not billiards, billiards are very special. Just take this model which I showed to you and look into level statistics. You can break all the symmetries. You can say it's symmetric and so on. There is no way you can get Wigner Dyson, not even close. So BGS conjecture or ETH is, is sufficient condition for like chaos, or because you are unpredictable, you can say it's ergodicity, but it's also unpredictability. You have word random, you cannot predict eigenstates. So you can say, yes, this is sufficient condition for chaos, but it's not necessary. So billiards, as I said, they're very special. So once you have you know, this mixed phase space or whatever, uh, you, you can never get Wigner Dyson statistics. And then I will mention that in the systems which are chaotic in any sense of this word, you cannot really predict anything, even if they are many body with weak integrability breaking, they still don't have Wigner Dyson statistics. So, Wigner Dyson statistics, it, it's really, that's why I spend so much time on, on and I will talk a bit later about the relation of this uh, random matrix statistics to thermodynamics. It turns out that once we take uh, this uh, as a conjecture, and I, I'll introduce ETH very soon, it's a like generalization of BGS, then we can recover all thermodynamics. But already I mentioned that this stationary eigenstates appear because of time averaging, right? So like stationary, they're analogs of time average trajectories, if you think about this. They're just quantized. So when we talk about uh, stationary eigenstates, we talk about long time behavior. So we talk about ergodicity. And indeed, from this BGS conjecture, you can predict emerging thermodynamics. But uh, when you talk about chaos, you have to s talk about unpredictability. Uh, this is not really the same thing, right? So I don't know, should we continue or? Well, I, know, I don't know, well, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we can post, like we can start or, maybe in, we, or in private maybe, so. Perhaps I suggest so that. So shall we maybe start, and start a bit later? At, uh, 11, 10, okay. So that they have a half an hour break. Okay. And the break is like outside at the terrace and the coffee break. Okay. okay. Thank you, Anatoly.